Hi, everyone. My name is Susan Wu. I'm in outbound product management in Google Cloud. Um, I'm here with my friends and colleagues. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm uh, Clayton Coleman. Uh, I'm really excited this year. I can finally claim that I have uh, 10 plus years uh, experience in Kubernetes. <laughs> so that's going straight on my resume, and hopefully I'll be uh, hireable someplace. Peter Pouliot, Ampere Computing. It's a pleasure to be here in Paris this week. Great to see everybody. Looking forward to a, a wonderful week talking about Kubernetes and cloud native. Yeah, I'm Ricardo. I'm a computing engineer at CERN. I'm also part of the TOC and the TAB in the CNCF. Really happy to be here. Meet everyone. Hi, I'm Lou. So I'm the PNC maintainer of the open source project called Alasio. And hopefully I can see like how we data, AI, and Kubernetes work together in QCOM. Okay, Clayton. Ready? <laughs> I guess so. Enterprises are building a lot of AI platforms on Kubernetes. And I hear platform operators talk about um, abstracting Kubernetes for, from the data scientists. Um, what can we do to make Kubernetes simpler? Oh my gosh, what can't we do to make Kubernetes simpler? Um, so it's interesting, um, data scientists don't need to know about Kubernetes, but there's a bunch of things that their platform teams are gonna need. Uh, and I think I, I, I can simplify by saying, uh, Kubernetes is supposed to be a cluster uh, or, uh, operating system, and the job of an operating system is to abstract hardware. So you heard from Kevin, uh, there's a bunch of exciting work going on uh, in a number of SIGs and Kubernetes around abstracting the resource model, making accelerators easier to uh, run, um, but making just the details that the platform admins need exposed up. Uh, above that, um, that's gonna lead to better opportunities for scheduling and bin packing, uh, for putting, uh, keeping those uh, really, really, really expensive accelerators working. And uh, the point of Kubernetes has always been to run multiple workloads together. And that's actually what helps a lot of people achieve significant efficiency. So on top of those uh, accelerators and a better resource model, we really do need uh, to bring batch frameworks like Slurm and Ray uh, closer to Kubernetes. We need to be able to support them effectively. And then uh, finally, since you know, training is really just the development part of the process, everybody's got to go to production at some point. And I think Kubernetes needs to be the best place um, to run production inference workloads. And so the focus, I think, will have to be um, constructs that make it easy to run those and to keep them running uh, on top of accelerators uh, pretty much 24-7. Sounds like something that our community should be proud to be part of, right? I hope so. <laughs> okay, Peter, I want to ask you about, um, so Kubernetes is already well-suited to handle the resource allocations. So, um, you know, for uh, what compute choices should these uh, platform owners make, especially for performance or for sustainability? Yeah, so Kubernetes and open source ecosystems have been great for LLM innovations. And open source small parameter LLMs are becoming more, a, a more pragmatic, pragmatic and available choice. Uh, however, for small parameter LLMs, you know, inference, uh, small parameter LLM inferencing, uh, a, a GPU-only approach isn't necessarily sustainable. Uh, we need something that's, uh, you know, affordable, uh, available, uh, and easy to use. Um, you know, LLM inference runs seamlessly today out of the box on AH64 architecture processors like Ampere, for example, across, uh, you know, uh, cloud providers. Uh, and uh, from a, uh, you know, it's, it has a proven uh, price per performance per watt uh, compared to the alternatives uh, today, specifically for, uh, you know, this use case. I think you have some credits that you're giving away, right? Oh, yeah. So Oracle, uh, last, uh, start, uh, Oracle announced last uh, KubeCon in Chicago, uh, they're offering uh, credits to be able to use uh, Ampere Compute within their cloud, specifically for uh, you know, CNCF-based projects and, and open source projects in general. So it's extremely exciting. Get out there and try it out. Uh, so Ricardo, um, so there's a known GPU shortage, and traditionally people are experiencing really low GPU utilization. Uh, what's happening? What, why is that happening? And also, what can, uh, techniques can operators use to increase their GPU utilization? Yep. So that's uh, something we've been looking at for, uh, for quite a while uh, by now. Uh, in research computing, scientific computing, we have some experience uh, running batch workloads and building a lot on what Clayton was also mentioning. Uh, we can kind of separate uh, two different pat patterns of usage. 
One is more the interactive kind of what we would say inference now as well, even CI/CD kind of workloads. Um, these are needs immediate access, but they tend to be quite spiky. Uh, and in there, we see very low uh, overall GPU utilization, um, something like 20, 30 percent in the order of, uh, of 20 to 30 percent. There are some things that we can do to try to optimize the, this pattern, which is to try to share better or maybe partitioning uh, the GPUs so that we can make the best of them. So there's several techniques that uh, are possible. And uh, there's a lot of work in the community as well to, to better support this. Uh, Clayton was mentioning a, a lot of these uh, ideas. Uh, I think it's something that we'll continue pushing for. Uh, and then we have more the batch workloads, uh, which are more predictable, but more long running as well. And here, what we want is really to make sure that we always have enough workloads on the queue mm. to, to make the best of the system and never have like pauses in between. Uh, there are some primitives that exist in traditional HPC uh, kind of uh, systems that are landing now uh, in the Kubernetes uh, and cloud native area as well. Uh, things like queues and uh, better uh, scheduling primitives, things like co-scheduling. Um, and this is kind of vital to ensure uh, we also cover uh, this type of workloads. And uh, I, I put here something that I heard uh, in, back in the AI day in Chicago. Uh, in a presentation that uh, the ideal situation we should look for is uh, uh, sharing resources where we can have both this kind of online and offline uh, workloads sharing the same pool uh, in a sort of tidal co-location. I think this is the, the aim we should try to go for. I have to ask you, Clayton, are there any you know, monitoring frameworks uh, that could monitor the GPU performance? There's not enough. Um, and I think this is actually an opportunity, um, both in the ecosystem and for vendors. There's a, a ton of great tools, um, you know, whether it's uh, monitoring accelerator usage, um, you know, have a rich history of um, CPU and host level monitoring. But I think as we're moving into this more complex era, we actually need uh, better tools for understanding um, you know, where capacity is going, how capacity is going to flow, um, whether the, uh, the necessary uh, needs of the workloads are being satisfied, um, the storage system, um, how data is flowing. And I think uh, we're just kind of at that beginning of stitching together this, you know, these massive AI supercomputers that all of us are going to end up running 10 years from now. And um, I think the, the monitoring systems have to uh, evolve with them. Yeah, that makes sense. Lou, we talked a lot about performance. I've seen you present talking about um, moving the G uh, CPU to the GPU so that you could speed up like data loading, data pre-processing. You know, what are some of those economic considerations that you want to share with the group? So talking about the economic consideration, I think the GPU utilization rate is one thing that we cannot avoid. Like building on Ricardo's insights about like how we can schedule in different kinds of jobs together to help to maximize the GPU utilization rate. Uh, so our approach is more like focusing on the traffic flow mm -hmm. and also the storage performance, which like Clayton have talked about. <laughs> like, so the approach is to attach CPU machines to GPU machines. So the CPU machines can focus on the initial data tasks, like data loading, data caching, and data preprocessing. While the GPU machines, they can focus on the chaining and serving. So it will largely reduce the GPU wait time, the time that we need to get data ready for AI. Hmm. So AI seems to be all about getting that information out of the data. So how do we get the data ready for AI? Yeah. So let's go a little more detail into it. So there are different approaches that how we can get data ready for AI for different kinds of AI workloads, like training and serving, they are kind of different. So we will share one of the simple example of how we can get data ready for AI training, leveraging two open source framework, the Alasio and Ray. So Alasio decouple the storage system from the AI framework. So the AI framework can assess different storage system using some unified namespace, like the local file system approach or Python AI approach, which the data scientists are pretty familiar with. And also, it can leverage the resources on the CPU machine. It can leverage the disk resources on the CPU machine for the caching capability. It can cache data for the AI chaining, which is especially helpful when the, when the chaining job you need to load the data again and again. Uh, 
And on the other side, like Ray, it can leverage some CPU, like resources on the CPU machine to in, uh, basically to facilitate the last mile data pre-processing. And with Ray, the data loading, caching, pre-processing, and chaining, they can all be paralleled and streamlined together and thus improve the overall GPU utilization rate. I think there's a operator for Ray from Kubernetes, right? There are, and um, you know, there's a lot of integrations you know, coming with Ray and Kubernetes, and I think that's a, a great opportunity for us to, to keep yeah. improving. Uh, Peter, uh, we talked a lot about accelerating AI performance in software. Uh, what can we do to optimize for maybe sustainability? So software accelerate, acceleration is a great start for LLM inference, uh, but we need a more sustainable compute to actually scale the workload, right? So for LLM inference, uh, GPU isn't always necessary, right? So uh, Ampere has done some extensive testing uh, with small parameter LLMs to uh, inference uh, running on our uh, compute. And uh, the empirical evidence that we're getting is, you know, it's very, uh, it, it's, it's, it's intriguing, right? Like we're, we're seeing uh, significant savings and in, in cost efficiency and, and uh, great metrics of, you know, in terms of that coming out. So, uh, you know, in some cases we're talking, you know, 40% to 80% less cost for operating. So, you know, and, and it's available today, you can, you can give it a try, right? So, uh, you know, in, in fact, later on today, you can come see it running, uh, running in the Oracle booth and, and witness uh, in an experience here for yourself. Ricardo, you're in infrastructure. It seems like the AI workload seems to be different um, from, uh, for, uh, than the typical Kubernetes workloads. Do you want to share some advice for folks because they might be running and um, operating the infrastructure for AI workloads? If not today, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the, there's uh, quite a lot of challenges. We, we've been discussing them uh, in the last couple of months uh, in different sessions at KubeCon and elsewhere. Uh, there are challenges internally if you're running your own uh, data centers uh, that were traditionally designed to host CPUs. Uh, the, when you start uh, increasing the density with things like GPUs, there are a lot of challenges. I think the, the main lesson we've learned uh, is to, to stay as flexible as possible in terms of uh, the infrastructure you can support. And what this means, uh, given the scarcity of GPUs that uh, Susan was mentioning at the start as well, is that uh, if you plan to be uh, flexible in terms of supporting multi-cluster workloads, and especially uh, supporting hybrid workloads, where you can have your, the majority of your workloads or the predictable workloads running on premises, if you can actually get hold of GPUs these days, but also complement that with, uh, with the ability to burst into, into uh, external resources where these GPUs might be available uh, in uh, larger numbers. This is really important. And it's, this is really a, a design a decision that has to be made quite early uh, to, to support multi-cluster, to be flexible on where, where the resources come, come from. This is a, a key decision to be made from the start. Yeah, well said. Um, so let me uh, kind of encapsulate and, and just kind of summarize. You heard a lot of points, but Kubernetes is really looking like it's becoming the standard for AI platforms, would you agree? And so, you know, let's work as a community to make these accelerated workloads run much better on Kubernetes. Uh, another thing, another consideration is Ricardo talked about the different workloads. So there might be some that are long running, some might be short and spiky. So make your resource allocations decisions based on the usage patterns, right? Um, Lou talked about speeding up the data loading, data pre-processing. Attach your CPUs to your GPU clusters. And then lastly, I actually heard this from my users and customers, they said, um, choose the right specialized compute for the right AI model. The job is to make it easier for you know, research scientists, data scientists to iterate much faster. So that's our job. So with that, I, I'm going to close at this time. And I want to thank the panelists. And we're going to be around for a hallway track. And uh, so look for us. And then um, you know, thank you for uh, having us on this. And please give us, uh, my panelists, a big round of applause. Thank you.